Hey folks, did you know that Card Player Poker offers free legal poker games with no deposit required where the players can win real money? The site is giving away six summer poker prize packages that include a $565 buy-in to the $1 million guaranteed live event in Las Vegas starting June 2nd, 2017, along with $500 for travel expenses. Go to poker.cardplayer.com for your chance to win. Again, that's poker.cardplayer.com for your shot to win a free poker package into a $1 million guaranteed live poker tournament this summer. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales both on and off the felt. Welcome back to another edition of Poker Stories, brought to you by card player The Poker Authority. Once again, I'm your host, Julio Rodriguez. This week's episode features kid poker himself, Daniel Negreanu, who is number one on the all-time tournament earnings list with just around $32 million. Uh, Daniel has six WSOP bracelets, two WPT titles, and he was the card player player of the year in both 2004 and 2013. Uh, Daniel insists that he's never had any media training, but that's really hard to believe. Uh, He's just always on. Uh, I've interviewed Daniel about a dozen times since 2006, but this was by far the longest amount of time I've had to pick his brain, and we got into a bunch of different topics. Just a quick reminder to please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. If you send your reviews to pokerstories at cardplayer.com, you'll also be in the running for a free digital subscription to the magazine. That's enough intro, right? Let's get into it. We are here with Daniel Negreanu uh, in your house. Thank yeah. you for having me over. Uh, it's St. Patrick's Day, but you're not out. No, I, as you know, I, we were just watching Terrence Chan, fellow podcaster, get his butt kicked by this kid, Keegan Oliver. So I'm not a big party drinker guy, um, so I had no real intention on I mean, I don't know. St. Patrick's Day is not a holiday I've ever really celebrated. Mm-hmm. It's just whatever. What green beer? That's, yeah. Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> when's the last? When's the last time you were the the party guy though? I mean, I, I, it's been a few years, right? You settled down. I've never really been naturally a party guy. Now I've partied, but my version mm-hmm. of partying is much different than what kids do. Because like, I drink alcohol, right? I don't do LSD and Molly. I've never done it. Not even once, right? Like none of that. No cocaine. No crack. Don't even do heroin. Right? So my version of party, and besides, it's not like really my scene, you know? I don't, I like music, sure. You left on mushrooms and weed, by the way. I don't do that. Actually, you know, the first time I tried that was when I was 37. I tried uh, marijuana for the first time at 37 mm-hmm. with Amanda Leatherman back in the day, <laughs> and she made me do oh, it. Oh, you outed her. <laughs> she, whatever. She made me do it. <laughs> and, I, and basically, at that point in my life with her, I would have done anything that she told me to do. <laughs> I was whipped. <laughs> oh, and, he, and proud, it sounds like. Yeah, just honest. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, so, yeah, not much of a partier these days. Uh, what about, you know, when you're on the road, um, you know... It, it seems to me like 10 years ago, you went to a tournament destination and you stayed the whole week regardless because there wasn't another one to go to right away. But now it seems like once you bust, you're on the plane to the next one. Uh, is there any time to sit around with, with your colleagues and, and enjoy uh, the road anymore? Actually, I'd challenge that and say the opposite is true, right? Really? Because okay. in the past, what would happen is you go play a main event, mm-hmm. right? You bust the main event. There's nothing left to play. So you just book the next flight out home. Now you go to like Barcelona, for example, right? Mm -hmm. You got the 50K that starts first. Then you got the main event. And then a couple days later, you got the 25K because they've learned that like post main event tournaments actually are a good idea. Yeah. So now, you know, I'm more likely to stay to the end. So like Monte Carlo coming up, there's 100K, there's the main event, and then there's the 25 at the end. So I'll stay for that. Mm -hmm. Whereas like before I would leave. As far as partying with people, when I'm on the road, I just focus on like my goal is to focus on playing. So no drinking before. If I happen to bust and there's nothing else going on, you know, there's a lot of cool young people in poker that I, I like to spend some time with, have some high-end conversations. So, yeah, I like to hang out with a lot of the, the crew. The Germans, actually. Very inspiring group of kids. They've adopted you as one of their own? I wouldn't say that. Okay. I just, like, I think that... Do you think like a computer now? No, not those Germans. The oh, ones okay. that came before the newer Germans. The newer <laughs> Germans are, we call Fedor bots. Mm-hmm. But the ones before, like Tobias Rankemeyer, Philip Grusom, 
Fabian Quas, you know, that group of, you know, Max Alter got, these are guys who like are focused on, you know, becoming better human beings on what's going on with the world, making a difference. Yeah. And I like that, you know, that's, it's, it's, I enjoy that sort of type of discussion. Uh, normally we talk about your, your past and your history, how you got into the game. I think it's well documented at this yeah. point. In fact, in a documentary, which yeah. you can actually see on Netflix right now, no excuse not to watch it, yeah. Kid Poker, watched it for the second time today to prepare. Nice. Um, it does a great job of kind of recapping your, your backstory, focusing on your parents. Uh, it kind of skips over the billiards part of it a little bit, though. I was wondering if you had any cool stories from that time, you know? I remember, like, you know, back then, the goal was just to, like, you know, you play for the table and five bucks, which, you know, you couldn't make a living doing that necessarily. I remember I had this one guy, Jason, on the hook. We were playing $2 a game. And no joke, by the end of it, I was uh, like, we just, he just doubled or nothing. So I was up okay. two, I was up four, I was up eight, I was up 16. I think I was up, uh, <laughs> what was it? Two, th- four thousand nine. I was up like 81, 92. Mm-hmm. And he wanted to play double or nothing again. I'm like, dude, you don't have $8,000. Oh, You're like, we're like 16, 17 years old. So <laughs> I said no to the last match. He owed me 8,000 bucks. I had my friend Randall, this six foot five, 360 pound dude. Collect, he carried a bat. <laughs> yeah, he collect, you know, I had him collect whatever. Whatever we could, and that was you know the best I could do there. Mm-hmm. You haven't shaken anybody down since. I have a lot of people that owe me money, and some of them I'm okay with in mm-hmm. the sense that you know they were honest, they're upfront about the situation, and I'm like, okay, I'll help you out. And there's others who are like absolutely something happened to me in the last year and a half with Mike Matiso that no one has ever no one has ever done anything more disgusting and dirty than what he did, mm-hmm. and he's just become such a like, I mean, I guess in every way like a, just a beaten down human being that's like. Just full. I just don't like the guy at all. Like, Mike has made some news recently. Uh, he got heads up with Helmuth at the LAPC. Lost, uh, I think, an Omaha, or maybe it was a, a stud and an Omaha uh, tournament. Yeah. Um, guess how much money of the money he owes me did I see? <laughs> if you guessed zero, you guessed correctly. <laughs> Total well, deadbeat. It's interesting. Um, you know, you're op- the the documentary focuses hard on the fact that you're outspoken and you're you're not. Uh, gonna apologize for that for being opinionated and you you know you have been called out people in the past uh i'm wondering how that jives with your new like focus on the positivity uh message it's it's in line because really when you think about it like at the core of all of it is integrity integrity is to say that you whatever you say you're gonna do you do right and you whatever you say is true and if sometimes I have things to say about certain people that are exactly the way that I see it, I'm going to say so. So that's not at odds necessarily with positivity. I, I spend the vast majority of my time focused on uplifting others and, and whatnot. But, you know, occasionally you have situations that come up that warrant, you know, a little, you know, brutal honesty. And, yeah. and I think, you know, I don't really, I really don't like focusing on like, you know, the negativity in the game. And that's really what is the drama that people like and enjoy, unfortunately. But, you know, I, it's, it just is what it is, I guess. <laughs> I mean, well, let's, let's take this podcast, for example, right? So the podcast is going to be titled uh, Poker Stories, Dan Negreanu, and that'll get tens of thousands of clicks just from your name alone. But I'm going to write a preview for it, and I need a headline. So usually what I would do is I would take the uh, most inflammatory thing you said sure. <laughs> uh, and run it up there. Um, in this case, already something about Mike, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I don't. I don't know what where where do you draw the line there? You know, like uh, between popularizing the game, getting eyeballs to the game, and maybe making the game look kind of uh, mm-hmm. bad. Yeah. Well, so the, I mentioned this in the weekly rant that I did on YouTube. Um, you know, it's it's sad to me because I did an interview with some guys a few weeks, or like a month ago, or whatever, and they it was a really positive interview. And I mentioned one thing about Helmuth, like I didn't think he played a hand well, he made a mistake or whatever. Mm-hmm. And the title was they wanted to do a title like Negranu trashes Helmuth, like, and I'm like, mm-hmm. what the? I was like, you why? And they they but they gave me like first right of refusal, the whole deal. So I said, you know what? Why so negative? And they said, listen, that's what works. People are unfortunately drawn to negative drama. Yeah, you know, saying like Negranu compliments Helmuth. Yeah. his appearance or something, right? That doesn't get as many clicks. <laughs> so we live in a society, unfortunately, where these tabloid, trashy headlines are what people respond to. And I mean, as long as I have a say, I don't want to be a part of that, to, you know? Because like we spent 30 minutes talking, one thing about Helmy's hand that wasn't very good, yeah. and that's what they wanted that's to focus on. And I don't blame them because their goal is to try to get clicks, right? Yeah. So they're trying to do what makes sense. It's just unfortunate 
that that's what works in our society. Uh, example, earlier this week, uh, one of our writers wrote a story about Dan Bilzerian's comments about the Kate Hall match um, with Mike Dentali. You know, he said something along the lines of, you know, women can't play poker, blah, blah. Yeah. That's an inflammatory quote. Came on his Twitter. We made it a headline. Sure. You know what I mean? Like, It's okay to accurately describe what someone said. I mean, he mm-hmm. said that. It's, like, it's, not like, it's not like you're framing his words in a different way. You're just telling it like you, you know, it was written. But when you have a choice of like titling a, you know, an entire article about somebody, yeah. then that's where you have to like consider like what, what matters to you most, right? And if it's number of clicks and hits, you know, negativity, unfortunately, is a clearly what works. Like I could, I already know that. Like I can yeah. write a bunch of them because there's, you know, if I wanted to, because they're <laughs> like, but I don't know. I just, find, I just find it cheesy. And like, I guess part of it is I find when you do that, you've sold your soul a little bit, you know, and it's like just pathetic. You know, to like yeah. want to get, just get headlines because the content's good. And people, you know, throw it around. They, they, they share it. They, you know, it goes viral that way. It doesn't have to be based on a click, clickbaity headline. I know. There's a lot of pressure to match your competition. And I think people get kind of dragged down by each other. Uh, but getting back to calling people out, do you, would you prefer a poker world where everyone's transparent about, you know, whether somebody uh, uh, screwed another person over in a backing mm-hmm. deal or owes someone money or try to take off a yeah. town? That's a really good question. And I got to say, uh, it's one I've been on the fence about, one I've been struggling with because I, I understand like both points of view. Old school mentality is, you know, nobody's business, right? Yeah. You know, you, if a guy comes in and he's a sh- you know shady, someone asks you, yeah, yeah, I say, I wouldn't loan that guy money. He's not. But like to go on the internet and post it to a bunch of people that it's not going to affect just for the sake of drama, that's always been something that's kind of been frowned upon, yeah. right? Because like I have like, and I'm currently right now I have a bunch of people who owe me money that I could just blast, mm-hmm. right? Some people that people, oh, what a great guy. And I'm like, yeah, he's owed me X amount of dollars for five years and I haven't seen anything, right? Um, but, you know, a lot of the new school players, and I, I get it, I think they're right. I, I really do. I think that they're right in saying that, like, by exposing this person, you help protect other people from getting screwed over. So it's made me f- question whether I was, I've been doing it the right way. And also, like, how will I go forward? There, like I said before, I have people who owe me money but they did it in a very honest way, I'm never going to out them. I'm yeah. never going to do it because they were very fr- upfront. If people who screwed me and there's a couple like where they said they had the money and then didn't or whatever and they still haven't paid or anything like that, those are people that I'm considering like putting on blast. And I'm what, you know, my own concern, I guess my concern from an integrity perspective is I always come from that school. So it would require a shift in my mindset, you know, to be an in integrity, to yeah. say like, you know, to say I've never done that. I've never really put anyone on blast for being broke. But if I start doing that, now it contradicts what I've been saying for so long. But it just it, it's an evolution of the way that I you know, view the issue. Yeah, plus you also don't want somebody going to one of these people and losing their money as well when you could have prevented it. No. I, I, that's a tough— Well, but the thing is in my world, for example, one of the guys that owes me money, mm-hmm. another friend of mine said, hey, so-and-so asked me for money. You know, do you have a figure with him? And I said, yeah, don't loan him money because it's been four years. So yeah. I tell them, but like at the same time, do I feel the need to just post it on Twitter? Yeah. Like that's where I'm like, I don't know, you know, I, yeah, I'm still on the fence about it. But if I do go public, I think it would like, you know, regardless of what headline I put, it would be shocking to a lot of people. I think if everyone was transparent about this, we'd lose half the poker world. Is that accurate? I don't think no, so. No, that's not half the poker world. Half of the big names, maybe? I don't think we'd lose them because they'll well, still find ways. Like, for example, you look at a guy like, and this is very public, so I don't mind saying so, you know, Chino Reem mm-hmm. has some debts or whatever. And uh, it's still, not like he keeps him out of action. You know, he's still Wayne able to find, you know, yeah. relationships and things like that. And there was also something romantic about the old school kind of players who were broke. Like, one of my favorite stories ever is the Thor Hansen one, mm-hmm. where he was at the final table of a tournament and paid a million dollars for first. And you know, Thor was always in and out of money, you know, just an old, old school kind of gambler guy. And the, you know, the interviewer asked him, he's like, so what are you going to do if you win the million? He goes, oh, you know, I'll pay off a few debts here and there, pay some bills. And then the girl said, well, what are you going to do about the rest? And he goes, oh, they're just going to have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> like, and she was like, huh? So, you know, he owes more than a million? <laughs> it was just – and that was, that's funny to me. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great line, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, getting back to, you know, your early days coming out to Vegas, you talk about going broke. Happened to you several times. In the documentary, it says you, you made several, like six or seven trips to Vegas going broke each time. Um, uh, one of the reasons you gave was you were a little over aggressive at the time. Um, but that couldn't have been it, right? 
all of it, right? Well, it was, was a combination there, was of there, things, right? Was there like pit gambling that, no. that led you astray? No, the only, the only the only additional thing that caused you know to let me to go broke was giving people money. Like I'd go to Vegas, I'd meet some people, make some new friends, and I don't know these guys are hustlers or whatever. Stake the guys, they never won. I remember a trip like early on. I went to I went to California, and I won sixty thousand on the trip, which was a lot of money back then. Yeah. Right. And I left with less money than I came with. Oh my god. Because you know everyone else that I was staking or like borrowing took more money. So I left. I went there with thirty thousand. I came back with twenty five, and I won sixty. <laughs> like how the hell do you pull that off? Yeah. Uh, that's amazing. Um, getting into uh, the, the biggest accomplishments, is it safe to assume the sixth bracelet is your proudest moment in poker? I, no, you know, I'm going to go back to 2004 in general okay. and say that the year was like epic for me in the way that it, you know, the, the, the very final event, I needed to come in the final table to retake the Card Player of the Year award. Mm-hmm. And I did it with the biggest chip lead in history. I won, you know, four big 10K televised events. And, you know, there's talk, obviously, in listen to Matt Parvis on his podcast talk about like the greatest run ever or like the greatest year ever. And obviously players are better today and you know, there's a lot more tough players, but like, I don't think that anyone's had a run like I did that year and everyone will. I won world series of poker player of the year, card player of the year, world poker tour player of the year. Yeah. And clearly, like I said, I was playing against a uh, weaker competition back then, but today, you know, the, the you know, the counter argument of that is like a lot of these guys that are having these runs, they're having them in fields of like 25, 30 people. Now you take, 25 people, right? Have them play 15 tournaments. Just throw random balls. Throw over 15 ran- You're going to have some that, like, do really, really well. Yeah. Like, much better. And people are going to go, wow. But a lot of it has to do with, you know, uh, luck and the fact that you can – they're so small, it just increases the chance that you can win them. So I don't care what anyone says. Any field of 300, any field of 300 is harder to win than any field of 20. I don't – you know, in, in a tournament that, you know, has – relatively fast like the aria tournaments you know even if you're up against 19 dan and agranius sure yes i I mean i'm not kidding like with just 20 players left i mean maybe that's a you know you can make an argument this isn't true but to be 300 i mean it just takes a you know a lot you need a lot of luck throughout and with 20 i mean you just don't need as much luck because you're already there you're almost at the final table right when you start um uh going back to 2004 I'm surprised you said 2004, not 2013, given the money that was won. Mm-hmm. I, I imagine you're in 2004 and you're going, can it get any better? And then all of a sudden, you know, you have a $10 million year instead of four. Well, poker changed, you yeah. know? Well, poker changed even when I got into it. But when did I got you into imagine it, it changing like it did? Yeah, well, not really exactly like with the high ro- rollers the way they are. But when I got into the game, there was one 10K, the main event. That was it. And then a new one was added, the U.S. Poker Championship. So there was a 7500 and a 10K. Other than that, we were playing $100, $300, $500 buy-in tournaments. That's where I was, like, building my role. And then the 10K started to come up, so I moved up the all-time money list and became number one, you know, partly because just there was more events with higher buy-ins. Yeah. Well, that's what we're seeing again now. Like, I'm still number one right now, but, you know, the, the, the lead is shortened because now the buy-ins are 100K, 50K, and they're happening, like, every couple weeks. So, uh so yeah, I mean it changes, but the actual money means less to me than the achievement itself. Like winning a tournament with 400 players is always going to mean more to me than winning a tournament with 30. And I don't care what the 30 is. Although the super high roller bowl is pretty special. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the but the money is a way is obviously important to you not because you need more money, but because it's the way we keep score. It's the way we keep track of the all time list, which you are still yeah. But I don't. In. That's not how I keep score. Okay. Like the all-time money list, and I'm and listen. I said this when I was number one. I said this when I wasn't. It doesn't really mean anything, right? It just means that I've been in the game long and I've had a lot of results. You know, it, you know, a lot of guys who could have like a three million dollar year or two million dollar year could lose money on the year. <laughs> you know, if they played like a bunch of million dollar and half a million dollar buy-ins. So, what matters to me more is like I love the World Series of Poker Player of the Year. You know. Um, just like stats like that. I care more about the because titles. Because you can dive players. into it and really go for it without necessarily having to grind all year long. Not only that. I mean, I, I, like, I used to love the grind for like card player of the year and stuff like that. And that's just not something that I'm up for anymore because I don't put enough volume in. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the GPI is an interesting thing. Um, so I like those kind of – I mean, the World Series right now is probably the pinnacle of what – I focus the majority of like what I want, what I what I don't, what I'm actually feel like I'm lacking in, mm-hmm. and I should be doing better at, and that's one area that I want to like up my stats, if you will. Okay, uh, well, we, you did bring up the all time tournament earnings list. There's a bunch of guys on there right now um, who are younger. Uh, what do you think the list is going to look like in ten years? Who stays on the top ten? Seidel, well, so Coleman, he, yeah, you know Fandiari. the list. The list is going to change because like. 
look at this. So, you know, these days you can just have, like six guys can get together and say, we're, we're going to play a $50 million buy-in tournament. Okay. I mean, I don't know. There's probably six guys that can do that. Winner has $300 million in earnings. Congratulations, you're the all-time money leader in poker, right? Kind of silly, right? I <laughs> yeah. mean, it is kind of silly. Like the whole thing's kind of silly. Having said that, it is fun to see, you know, like a lot of the young up-and-comers. They're coming up in a generation now where they should be able to overtake me because I'm not going to put in the volume. Like, you know, Panama is going on right now. I'm not there. You know, yeah. I'm not playing the Arias regularly and stuff. So very easy for them to put up three, four million dollars a year for like five, six years straight. And who knows how big the tournaments are going to get. I don't think they're going to get much bigger, frankly. Just don't see why. Like, I don't think we're going to see that million dollar buy-in come back anytime soon. The super high rollable is like the new pinnacle prestigious event. And that's at a 300K buy-in, which is plenty. Yeah. And 10 years from now, are you going to be on the list? Yeah, no, I'll definitely be on the list. There's like, I mean, there's, it, would be, it would be close to impossible for me to see a scenario where I go. For, I might be on the list even if I don't cash again, right? <laughs> there's very actually, you know what? In ten years from now, there's a very good chance that with what I've won, uh, thirty-two million or something, that I don't need to put another cash me in the top ten. Uh, having said that, I'm going to play. I'm going to play the high rollers occasionally when I can, and um, and of course all the World Series events. I want to go back to the poker boom because you got hot like right before, and. Um, I feel like you capitalized very quickly on uh, the cameras and, and you were very aware of what it could do for you. Am I wrong there? Or? So actually, I would say that I, just, I got hot during because okay. the first year of the World Poker Tour that launched, I made zero final tables. I was not part of the conversation of you know an ambassador to promote the game. I was a little frustrated by that. I would have liked to have had more of a stage, yeah. right? And the second season is when I did well, where you know I had a second and a third and I, and I started to like... You know, and then the next year I won Player of the Year or something yeah. like that in 2004. So, um, yeah, no, I, I was like, I struck while the iron was hot right during that period. And I felt uniquely qualified to fill the role of whatever you want to call it, poker ambassador for lack of a better term. Um, because I'm very comfortable on camera, because I feel like for the most part when I'm at the table, I like to have fun. I'm engaging. And I think especially during that time, poker was reality TV. And the people wanted to get to know these characters. And, you know, there's a lot of characters back then. We don't see that quite the same way what we did back then. But, and I just happened to be one of the characters that I think if I had to describe it best, it would be like mama's boy. You know, my mom was always around. It was like, I did re- I did really well with like middle America grandmas. Like they like Daniel Negreanu. <laughs> yeah. Because he loves his mother and, and she brings him lunch. <laughs> yeah. And I was like smiling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that's 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 the recipe i just i over. was just watching the clip of you versus david williams heads up and he's like oh you're slow rolling me with aces and i'm like i feel like daniel's performing i don't know it, it wasn't even a slow roll too because it was just like <laughs> i guess it was obviously a slow roll with the aces but i was like i was, I was actually thinking about it because he was mm-hmm. playing real aggro and i thought like i can wait for a better spot here no i didn't really but i was like i knew when we got the money in or at least i thought I, that I would have the best hand, right? So I'm like, okay, is this the one? Is this, he was pretty confident. I knew he had a hand. So I'm like, well, I guess we got to gamble. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Um, what about like the endorsement situation back then? Because, you know, there was money flying around in Bobby's room, apparently, with all the Full Tilt investors. And uh, I, I heard a rumor you were approached by, you know, Party and Full Tilt, and, and then Poker Mountain happened, and then you had the win. And, you know, um, what, what was it like back then? And kind of trying to decipher what road to go down Mm. well thankfully and uh you know that whole era i did a podcast with brian balsbog my agent and you know we talked about the golden days and what it was like and how different it is uh to from today and luckily he we became friendly early on so he was my confidant he was my guy that like could really kind of guide me and you know help me decide what made the most sense so for example when it came time to sign with an online poker company. I was always waiting. I was waiting for the right situation, right yeah. opportunity. I remember a showdown at the Sands <clears throat> when I was at a final table. I was approached to wear a hat and they were going to give me $20,000, a party poker hat, wow. a full tilt. And I said, no, I, I turned it down. And at the time I had a lot of money. I was playing real high stakes poker, but really like I didn't want to just represent a brand for the day. You know, I thought that I wanted to, you know, do something bigger, something yeah. on my own or, or something along those lines. Um, ultimately what, you know, the real success for me was full contact poker, which in six months I had built up from nothing all basically with my own money. And within six months I had an offer to sell it for $170 million. Yeah. And literally three days later, this thing called the UIGEA happened. So they pulled the plug on the offer and, uh, that was no longer something that was going to happen. But 
then, you know, we um, plugged away and Brian, you know, shot me around a little bit to, to different online sites. And yeah. it always made sense because I would always play it at Poker Stars and they were the ones that I trusted most. I have a relationship with Isai Scheinberg since mm-hmm. I was 17 back in Toronto. Oh, wow. Yeah. He offered me. Well, that's way another, back. People don't know this, but like before Poker Stars that happened, he offered me 3% of the company to be a consultant. 3%. Yeah, no big deal. I said no. <laughs> I said no thanks. <laughs> How do you get up in the mornings? <laughs> no, whatever. I mean, my life's good. The only thing that would be different if I had that kind of money is I would own a private jet. Or maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> private jet would be kind of cool. I just, But you know what? I kind of have one. Not that I have one, but like Jet Smarter. I use that. And it's like a membership, and you can fly. Yeah, tell me how you fly these days. You must be a pro at flying. Are you asleep when you fly? Are you, do you do your work? Are you a movie watcher? A little bit of everything. Like, podcast has been my new my new mm-hmm. jam. Yeah. But depending on the flight, right? So if you're just going to L.A., you know, uh, I'll take the Jet Smarter flights. Typically, it's real real easy. You don't have to go through security. You just get right on the plane, land, go. But Europe, I mean, I always fly business or first class. Like, I just, I've never flown to Europe, coach, and I'm never open to it because <laughs> I don't like sitting as is. I hate sitting. I always like to lie down, and when you, you know when you're on one of those flights, I like going to Australia is a pleasure. It's a 14, 15 hour flight, and sometimes as we're landing, I'm like, ah, oh, shoot, oh you know, gosh. I'm still napping because it's very, very comfortable. Yeah, uh, I'm a good flyer. Five hours, and I'm ready to get off any. Place. Well, that's if you're sitting. I would. I don't. I'd <laughs> rather fly to Australia, business or first class, than I would f- go from Las Vegas to New York. In coach. Yeah, <laughs> it makes sense. <laughs> uh, you you are one of the poker players who. Has a very lengthy IMDb page. <laughs> yeah. Um, X Men Origins. Did you see the lo- new Logan movie, by the way? I did see it the other day. Uh, it was yeah. Last week I saw it, yeah. Not as good as yours, I bet, right? I loved it. I thought it was good. <laughs> yeah, it was good. A little bit of a tearjerker, but a good one. Yeah. Um, you were in a Katy Perry music video. True uh, story. The wonderful show known as Tilt. <laughs> yeah, I was in Tilt also. What was your What was your favorite of, uh, of all those projects? So the project that I was... I enjoyed most was uh, a guy named Jerry D, who's Canadian. He has the Mr. D Show, which is a very popular sitcom in Canada. Mm-hmm. And we did an episode which revolved basically around me. And it was a lot of ad lib, and it was a lot. Of, it was an opportunity to actually act. Like you see me in Wolverine, I wasn't acting. I just did one stupid little. You were you, scene. Yeah. yeah. But in the you know, and I was still me in the um, Mr. D episode. But it was really funny. Uh, basically, I was like myself, but broke. And he sees me at a bar, and he's like, this is Daniel Ni- Niagara, or whatever, right? <laughs> and then, like, he takes me in. I sleep on his couch. Then, he, you know, he gives me his credit card to play a little online poker. You know, I go – he kicks me out of the house. It just – it was fun because yeah. we got to – I got to actually act, and, and, I, and I enjoy that. That's cool. Um, <laughs> uh, I feel like um, – hold on. Jennifer told a story about you losing all of your uh, $30,000 bankroll in the big game. Um, in the documentary, was that the lowest point of your career? No, I mean no? that that was no big deal. That the was just way one the of documentary many. describes it. It seems like yeah. it horrible. Yeah, but you know, it was like that moment. I can tell you that moment happened fifteen times, right? So you know, in the documentary, they have to frame it in such a way to like you know, you know, to sort of drama- dramatize the moment. And it was obviously not a good thing, mm-hmm. but it was like probably the seventh or eighth time I've done something that's stupid. Maybe not with the same amount of money, mm-hmm. maybe sometimes more, sometimes less. Like if you have $2,000 and you blow 2000 right? That's no different to me than like having 30 and blowing 30, really. It's like- It's still 100% of yeah, your money. Yeah, exactly. It equals <laughs> bad on both cases. Um, a few days ago, I liked one of your tweets. You said, discipline trumps talent in the long run. Uh, you were explaining why Chip was better than Stu. Mm-hmm. Or at least somebody uh, had posed the question. Um, can you talk about longevity and, and you know what it takes to be in this game? Because you know some of these these guys who are in the top ten have only been playing for three, four years. You know, mm-hmm. in a couple cases, uh, what does it take to be in the game a lifetime? Well, first and foremost, a passion for the game. Right, you have to love the game. If you stop like, if you stop enjoying playing, mm-hmm. if you, and you don't like it anymore, you're pretty much done. You know, and you see a lot of younger kids today that. You know, they really put their heart and soul into the game for a good solid three, four years. They have some success and then they move on. They move on to other things or whatever Um, because maybe poker wasn't their passion. It was a stepping stone to something else. So passion and also a real self-aware introspective look at where your game is at and a fair judgment of what needs to be worked on because if you look at the 2004 era, a lot of the guys that were the stars of the, the game back then, you just don't see them anymore. They're not. 
yeah. in the game anymore. And a lot of it had to do with a little bit of a combination of arrogance and lack of self-awareness and realizing that like these young kids are good. And if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. By how long how long did it take you before you, you learned the lesson? I think around 2009, 2010. You know, I was like, ah, these kids, not a three bet, five bet, six bet. There was like a phase around 2010, 11 where everybody was six betting. It was all pre flop. Yeah. It's really just, they were playing terrible. Well, honestly. But, <laughs> but anyway, like around 2010, not I realized. Not small ball. Yeah. In, in 2010, I realized early in 2010, I decided to jump into the big games online. So I was playing one in 200, no limit hold'em against like Big Cheese, Tom Marchese, Rich Lindaker, Bill Reynolds, like a bunch of the the best players at the time in those games. And I remember, you know, it was a learning curve for me, right? So when I'd sit in the game, there'd be a list, you know, 50, 30, 40 players long. And I knew that I improved quickly because within a month, not only was there no list, I was playing three-handed and there was like nobody else jumping in the game. Mm -hmm. So that let me know, even though I started out winning and then when I started to get better, I started losing. It was so stupid. (laughs) But, uh, But overall, like I knew going into it, into the experience that, I was not a favorite in the games, but it, I was using it as a learning tool. See, and someone else might, with a bigger ego, might see a wait list and be like, look at all these people who want to play with me. <laughs> yeah, no, that's something Phil would say. <laughs> Phil helped me. <laughs> I like it. Um, you know, you've always been a talkative guy at the table. Uh, you've already said what you, you know what you thought about William Kasuf, uh, but, but would, do you wish more poker players took a, a, a more vocal approach to the game? I look at it this way, right? I don't feel like a player who plays poker has any responsibility whatsoever to be different than who they are, right? If a guy's not really a talkative person and he's just kind of quiet, like I don't expect him to just because he's playing for money on TV now be forced to go entertain us. No, like that's not what he signed up for necessarily. I do think that for, from the, so separate of the fact that I feel like they have no obligation for the growth of the game or for the betterment of the game, it's important that characters are developed. Part of the process of doing that is on the producers of the shows and different things like that to make it entertaining and interesting. Um, but, and, and you're always, it's just good to have characters in the game. A kid like Luke Schwartz, you know, a kid like William Kasuf. They're, di- they're polarizing figures. People either love them or they hate them, and that's a good thing. We've had plenty in our history of like Devilfish and Phil Hellmuth and Sammy Farha, you know, but today. Mike Mattisau. Yeah, Mike Mattisau is another <laughs> one. But today, um, the danger, I guess, would be is if, the vast majority of the game is like robotic, slow, tanking with no emotion. Like, you know, I, I got sad when I saw like Kelly Minkin at one point. She won a pot and she apologized for celebrating. And I'm like, celebrate. There's no th- when did it become not cool to win a pot and go, yes, that's all. <laughs> like, when did that become like, oh my gosh, that's like so wrong. No, I, it's important. You know, people want to see the real you. Part of what made poker interesting was, like I said earlier, it was reality TV They're at its best because it's real people playing with real money for life-changing amounts. And what, you just want to have no emotion and just be like, thanks. Like when Dan Coleman won and he beat me, I'm like, yeah. dude, you know, you could smile. He just won like 15 million. You don't talk to the media, but he you just smile. At least, a, you know, a <laughs> snicker. Come on. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> uh, a weirdest fan interaction. Well, that's got to be easy. That's um, the lady who came to the World Series of Poker. And uh, she you asked me- this story before? Sorry. Yeah, yeah there's, sorry. The, there's pictures, but then she came and- uh, <laughs> Asked me to sign her tramp stamp area, like right in her lower back. Mm-hmm. Signed my name there. So I did. I signed her name. And she was like, thanks. I'm going to go get this tattooed and come back tomorrow and make my husband happy. And I was like, ha ha. Right? She comes back the next day. Tattooed my name in. Put Kid Poker 2010 Rio. Right? And I'm like, oh, wow. She even dated it? <laughs> she put the whole thing. And then like, then I met her husband. And uh, he said to me, he's like, because like she thought it would get her more attention from him because he's a big poker fan oh my god right so now he says every time i tap my wife i gotta see your name <laughs> talk about a misguided attempt at romance yeah well they worked I for that a poker player's name on me yeah so that's <laughs> got to be the weirdest right yeah that's that's hmm. pretty weird um part of the double-edged sort of fame being the number one all-time uh, tournament earnings leader is that people talk a lot of shit <laughs> What's the what's the most frustrating thing you've read about yourself or the most outlandish, I should so, say? So the most frustrating thing, I don't care if people have opinions about me. Mm-hmm. That's fine. You don't think if you think I suck at poker, that never bothers me. What bothers me is when people like either lie or mischaracterize or say I said things I didn't say. This 
frustrates me to no end because A, you don't defend yourself, it becomes fact, right? In the world that we live in. You don't say anything right. about it. If you don't defend yourself, then everyone just believes like, oh, like the, specifically this whole thing with rake, like people, people were actually thinking because I was using an analogy in a 30 minute video, I was describing different scenarios. And the, what I said in the analogy is 100% accurate. Yeah. And if you read the transcript of what I said, it actually makes sense. But it's paraphrased into one sentence and now it sounds like I love rake and I think the rake should be really high and it's good for poker. Bullshit. I, first of all, I don't think that. And if you think I think that, it's not true. But hearing it repeated, like on my YouTube comments, we're like, oh, stop. You know you think it's good or you said that. I'm like, no, I didn't at all. And I sometimes when they come back at me, like I'm a big, I'm a much stronger guy now. Like, and I know they're keyboard warriors, like, and violence is not the answer. But I really want to <laughs> beat the shit out of them. I want to punch them in the fucking face. Yeah. Seriously. Because I'm like, what the, enough's enough, all right? I've said many times, no, I don't think high rake is good for the game. What I was explaining was, if you see a game with a really high rake, too high rake for pros to play in, it's probably a really good game because yeah. the only people dumb enough to play are guys who don't care. So they're loosey-goosey. They play every hand. They see a lot of flops. So the quality of the game, like the experience, it's probably a fun game, right? Versus a game, you know, has like low rake and you got a bunch of pros in it and they all tank for 45 seconds. Now, does that mean I think it's good for poker to raise the rake? No. You know? It must be exhausting to constantly... Uh, not only be in the public eye, but have everything you say scrutinized. I mean, are you the type of guy who goes to the grocery store with his hat down low and doesn't want to? No. The truth is, depending where I am, most of the time I'm fine. You know, poker isn't as big as it was. Like a lot of guys are trying to make poker big again. It's never going to be like what it was. During the heyday, I mean, there were times where everywhere I went, people recognized me. Yeah. Right. Today, and I also look a lot different now. You know, I don't have the blonde hair. I've got muscles now. I've got a beard. <laughs> the whole deal. But um, yeah, I like in the like in the hair. Yeah, and, I got uh, you know a whole bunch. I pay the best hair money could buy. And um, <laughs> so I mean, it still happens depending where you're at. Like if I'm obviously at the World Series of Poker or poker events, it's pretty common. But sometimes you know I'm at, I'm on a flight from whatever from London to Paris or something. You know, I'm left alone for the most part. I mean, yeah. occasionally, like say if there's a hundred people, five percent will say something to me in that neighborhood. What percent do you think recognizes you, though? Probably more than that. But, like, if you, especially in Europe, people are very respectful. Like, you go to in, you go to London, like, even if they do recognize you, they leave you alone. Yeah. You know, there's other parts of the world where, like, I Take won't Take my picture! <laughs> they're just very aggro. Like, Italians, man, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. I could be, like, in the middle of a phone call, and be like, that picture, take a picture. And they would take your hat off, and give me your hat. Like, what the f- <laughs> So I need this hat. Give me, give me your wallet. <laughs> give me your patch. I'm like, this is my patch. Yeah. Um, I had a question about the about the tournament of champions in 04, was it? I, I heard a rumor that they, they everyone wanted to chop it immediately. And Dan Underground, you said no. Yeah. Well, and then they waited until you busted, and then they all chopped it immediately. And then all the stuff with Annie and Helmy heads up was fake. So she's lied under oath or whatever. She lied about it. Because they did make a deal. Mm -hmm. She's claimed that they haven't. The reason I was opposed to making a deal was because first and foremost, I signed a contract with ESPN that prohibited me from making a deal. There was a $5 million fine if you made a deal. That seems harsh. (laughs) Yeah. So it was a $2 million giveaway. They have every right to impose these types of things. So there was talk of a deal at around seven-handed or something. And I'm like, I first of all, I don't make deals anyway. So I said no. And then then I do know for a fact that like when they got three-handed, they did make a deal. Now... They didn't get sued. No, you know, no harm, no, no done. I understand why they would want to make a deal. I mean, you're talking about a lot of money. Having said that, you know, if I sign a contract that says I'm going to abide by the rules of the contract, I'm going to abide by the rules of the contract. Like I didn't want to open myself up to being sued for five million. She went on and like I remember she went on some sort of Craig Ferguson talk show or whatever and said like you know they asked if there was a deal and she said no, like the absolute lie. She got all two million, huh? No, it was an absolute. You know, they three handed deal for sure. Um, do you remember the last time you were nervous at the table? Hmm. Not really. You know, I don't really get nervous at the table. There are times where I get intense or I get like really frustrated in a hand where like I don't know what to do. One happened with the, the last Aria tournament I played against David Peters. Yeah, I heard about the hand on the podcast. Yeah, so then he moved in on the river and I tanked for a really long time. Like, well, a long time for me, which is a minute and a half. Not like kids tanking, like seven, <laughs> eight minutes. But it was very frustrating because I'm like, man, I really don't know what to do here. And I knew what the right move was, but I didn't. I, then I didn't do it. So I guess, I don't know if nervous was the right word, but like anxious maybe a little bit about screwing this up not even when you were nearing the the main event final table a couple years ago there was a different feeling it was adrenaline man it was like such a rush um i was just i was so focused during that tournament like so intently on my game and really feeling good about like my destiny which was to win the thing and so when i was all in 
my body was like shaking. I had blood. Run. I didn't. I don't hide my emotions. Like I'm not that. I'm not. I'm not too cool for school. Yeah. I was definitely excited <laughs> about you know the hand. And then when I lost, when the river card came, I like I fell to the ground. You know, and that was, was legit. that was okay. So did you faint or was it like? No, a, I didn't faint. I just saw the card and I was like dejected. And my did and your my, legs stop working? My knees kind of just were like okay, just. <laughs> I mean, the picture of it won an award. It was an iconic yeah. moment in poker. So yeah, just ha- in that moment, I just was like floored. There was okay. So there you didn't so- like right before the river go. If I get if he no hits, gonna, no 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 fall back. No, I wasn't thinking. I didn't. I was sure I was going to win that hand. And like just the room, the electricity in the room was like epic. There was it so was so many people in, in the Thunderdome that day. I've never seen people more excited and then simultaneously more disappointed. Yeah, from a crowd perspective, I was very aware of like what it meant for poker. Like I'm not oblivious to the fact that me making the November nine would have been good for the game if you will but uh hey i was playing to win so there are pros today coming up who said they looked up to you growing up um but i'm wondering if poker was a thing enough for you to have the same sort of uh um not idols but people you looked up to in the game absolutely before i went out to vegas in Toronto, I got hold of those ESPN videos of like Phil Hellmuth winning and Stu Unger. So Phil kid. Hellmuth's your idol? No, <laughs> Phil Hellmuth's not my idol, but I remember seeing There's that and thinking that was pretty cool. Um, and then Stu Unger, of course, like the kid. Uh, I mean, I felt a very, I don't know, an odd connection. I have a story that people won't believe, so I, I don't usually like to tell it because it makes me look like a crazy person. But uh, I have a story about a connection to Stu Unger that's out there. Well, is it a, is it a po- post-mortem connection? So uh, to make the long story short, I had a dream uh, that Stu Unger from like the basement of my house, cold, wet, like just dark, damp place, said to me, uh, "Kid, don't you're you're the next one. Don't do what I did." Right? Okay. It's a goofy dream like that, right? So what? This is where people will think I'm full of shit. He died that night. What? Yeah. This wasn't after. No. He. This was in 1998, and the next morning, the news hit that he was found in a hotel dead so i got i had this dream i know right i mean i don't know listen i I mean like i the reason i don't tell is people like (laughs) oh you know it sounds crazy creepy but and i don't know what it meant i don't know what but like i remember it happening right at that time and like you know obviously what he was saying is don't do drugs don't do those things don't be gambler and don't be crazy and uh i don't know it's just it was creepy (laughs) yeah that's super creepy yeah Oh man! <laughs> yeah. Um, so I wouldn't say he was my role model necessarily, no. but uh, maybe uh, an example of what not to do. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, do you remember the worst bad beat you ever put on anybody? That I put on anybody? <laughs> I don't like asking you what the worst bad beat you suffered was. Yeah, you know. honestly, not really. Yeah, couldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, best gambling degen story, but outside of poker. I, the documentary says you lost twenty k to to uh, Jennifer on a bet of whether she bet a turn or something like that. I imagine there's bigger figures and crazier stories. I think the craziest figures that we dealt with was when golf gambling was at its peak. You know, I was like such a sucker when I started because like I would go up to the first tee and Mike Sexton wrote about this in his book. Mm-hmm. I was like, you know, how many am I getting from you? Okay, five, 50,000 hole, 50,000 hole. I was betting like 200, you know, I was basically like I, all these guys are hustlers. All these guys know what they're doing. I suck. I can't make a double bogey. Yeah. But I'm like, oh, well, they're giving me spots. That's fair, right? And I remember Phil Ivey looking at me going, what are you doing, man? <laughs> like, you're just, you can't win, right? So I'd like, I lost, like, I was probably stuck like two, three million playing golf before I got Christian Sanchez yeah. to work with me. And then I got all the money back. And the, the most epic golf stories were when myself, Christian, a couple of my buddies, like, I was the tallest one of the bunch at 5'9", <laughs> played against Patrick Antonius, one of his pro friends, and another guy. We played these epic scramble matches okay. over over a weekend where we play three straight days, like 150,000 a hole, something like that. Oh man. We got a T spot. That, that was epic. And I, like two years in a row, I beat Patrick and the crew out of like 1 million plus, you know, two years in a row. Cause you know, we had the one thing we just negotiated a better game because we had four players. They had three, all three were better than us, except Christian played with us, but we had four guys that could putt. They had one guy who could putt really well. One guy who was okay. And then we're not that great. And, but the thing is we get four putts, they get three. Drive it's pretty for show. Yeah, it's a pretty big advantage. Yeah. So we uh, we beat them two years in a row, and then they didn't come back for the By third. the fourth putt, you should have a pretty good idea of the break. <laughs> well, by then, is, and the cool thing is, is Christian, who's our you know guru and best putter, and I would be second best, Would uh, he'd have three looks at it. Yeah. So he knows exactly what the putt's going to do. And so he would, you know, if he if I didn't nail it after two, he would nail it well, after Well, you two. mentioned you wanted to get back into golfing uh, because you've been in a soccer kick lately. But um, mm-hmm. 
So what's your game look like these days? Well, I played last week for the first time last Saturday, and I'm going to play tomorrow. Right here? Like No, I play at TPC Summerlin. Okay. Pretty much exclusively. And I was the first time out in like, I played once in September and really not a, before that in May. So I played from the up tees because why not? You know, just want get, to get back in the groove. And I shot 90, which I'm okay with. I mean, first yeah. time back, it's not bad. So tomorrow we look to, you know, improve on that and then move back to normal tees with the quote unquote big boys in the back. But uh, it's fun. Like the reason I wasn't going to play golf as much is because I really have taken on working out physically mm-hmm. and soccer. So there's just not a lot of time in the day to do that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play golf during the day and then at night i'm gonna head to the gym yeah because on, on nights that are not soccer nights so i fill myself with a lot of physical activity I, I i don't know how you do it if i if i play around there's no way i'm going to the gym actually there's no way i'm going to the gym regardless <laughs> yeah, let's right? be honest the <laughs> round of golf was a miracle in the first place <laughs> yeah <laughs> um least favorite thing about the poker world i know you have a rant um but what about a static thing that just kind of always irked you I guess the fact that, and this is something I'm guilty of too, because it's it's one of the aspects of my personality that I'm not proud of or I don't like, but I see it, and that's why I see it in other people. Is there's just such a sense of know-it-all arrogance and condescension, um, and typically, uh, and then I was just like this when I was 22. I looked at the guys that came before me and like they suck, right? Yeah. And every young kid who comes in the game, they pretty much you know have that sort of idea where. They know everything and, you know, they've read some stuff on the internet, so they know everything about every issue, you know, from politics to nutrition and stuff. So I guess overall, like the world draw is, you know, people like that are drawn to poker, right? People that are confident in themselves, have a, a belief that they're better than other people because they're, they wouldn't otherwise put their money up against outwitting other people. So a lot of players, people are like that. Having said that, I've noticed this, a trend and a shift. Like I said, with a lot of the young Germans and a lot of people like that are, uh, in their mid to late twenties now that are really kind of like having a positive uplifting outlook on life. And that's something that I can really connect with. I spoke to Jason Kuhn actually about something similar. I was thinking where, about him. Yeah. And he was, and he was saying the same thing, you know, like we're all trying to get to this goal, this number in our mind. And we stop, if we stop and just go, Whoa, we're living the life already. Pretty nice. Yeah. And I guess part of it is like, you know, and you see it with some of the younger guys, like just, there's a jealousy. And there's this idea that, like, they don't really root for other people to do well. They want to just, like, have them fail so they feel better about themselves. So, like, Fedor Holt's a perfect example, right? Now, Fedor had an incredible year. He's, like, obviously one of the best and everything. And, but you have some people, like, hoping that he runs bad. Yeah. Because if he doesn't, then it sort of makes them feel like, wow. So He's just that much better? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Like, because then it just it, 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 it invalidates the idea that they have about themselves being unlucky. Oh, if I was as lucky as Fedor. Well, if he wins every year for like five, six, seven, eight to ten years, you know, might just not be luck, you know. I mean, sure, luck plays a role, but it's not the be-all, end-all. I don't want to keep you too much longer. I only have a few more questions. Uh, these are some fun, fast ones. Who's the best poker player we've never heard of? So somebody that the media kind of ignores. Uh, um, well, you've never heard of, huh? Let's Maybe say I've some, heard of him, but... Yeah, somebody on the fringe who's like... He incorporates old school poker, and he's a younger guy, and that's, uh, I'd say, Eddie Sabat. Okay. Because Eddie, like, he's good, really good at reading people, like, extremely good at it. And he's fundamentally, his game is not fundamentally sound. He makes plays that are not, like, kids will laugh at him and go, like, ha, ha, that's not GTO. I'm like, yeah, but he also knows, based on the way that you lick your lips, whether you have it or not. So yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. I interviewed Eddie, and he didn't really talk about his uh, yeah, live why would he? reads. I shouldn't have told on him. <laughs> Great head of hair, though, on that kid. Yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes you're rocking headphones at the table. What are you listening to? Still a, little, a lot of reggae and rap? Well, honestly, often I'm listening to podcasts. That's my new jam. Mm-hmm. But and when I'm at the gym, I'm doing some like kind of like dancey work- workout music. But Bob Marley's always like... Wait, wait, wait. Get back to the dancey music. <laughs> well, like, who are we talking here? You know, like the David Guetta shit. Whatever, like, okay. is good. Whatever is pumped up music, like, you know, Rocky, the Rocky soundtrack yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Something along those lines. But um, outside of that, actually one that I really like, especially in the theme, is Deontwood. Okay. Deontwood, they're freaking crazy. Yeah, I who, love that who got, style. Who told me about them? Matt Shawell over at po- uh, yeah. Poker Listings. Hey, fatty uh, boom boom, hit me with the ching ching, dollar I sing sing. He, he sent me a music video. He's like, check these guys out. They're this crazy. was like six, seven years ago. I said, that is unlistenable, Matt. Please never give it's me awesome. your admission. I love it. <laughs> it is so good. Oh, man. I um, think you freaky, but I like you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so uh right now we have doyle still killing it you know still going strong um maybe billy baxter but really there's only one doyle 
So who's going to be the Doyle from your generation? Mm-hmm. Is it you? Yeah. I think maybe Jason Mercier, actually. Because okay. Jason has a deep love for poker that is strong. Like, he plays nonstop. He's got the D-Gen gambler in him that mm-hmm. I don't. Like, part of what Doyle, part of what drives Doyle to be as good as he is at this age is he loves to play every day. I have a very balanced life in terms of interests. So I'm never going to be the guy that is starting the shop at Bellagio's big game. I'll be the guy that shows up occasionally to play. But uh, I'm going to go with Jason Mercier. All right, I like that. You're not the you're not the uh, the first person they say Jason because he does seem to be a glutton for punishment when it comes to grinding. He just loves to play. Yeah. yeah. Um, we always end the podcast the same way with a random question generated. So okay. If you want to sweat it, I'm hitting refresh. Can't even see it. Okay, what's it say? That's I see. That's not gonna work. What's your family like? Watch the documentary yeah, on bugger. Netflix. Listen, if you don't have a Netflix account, then you're not listening to this podcast. So there's no excuse for you not to see this documentary. <laughs> yeah. Okay, here's one. Read what kind of me. what kind of old person do you want to grow up to become? I want to become an old person that is the guy that's like still at the gym, still playing soccer. That isn't like he's like 70 and there's kids that are 25 and he can kick their ass. <laughs> yeah, I want to be the one that's physically fit that still looks young. And, uh, and, you know, is like upbeat and doesn't feel old. Because I still feel 26, and I'm going to stay 26 for life. Yeah, get, get that old man strength, too. It's a, it's a state of mind, really. Age is. I know that a lot of times when people have kids, it sort of ages them, in a sense. Mm-hmm. Like, you become more responsible. You don't sleep as much, you know, and the, and, and the like. But um, I really do believe, ultimately, it's like a state of mind. Like, people say, oh, I'm so old. I'm like, you're 31. Like, you're not old compared to people that are 80. Yeah. You're old compared to people that are 25. It's depending on where your focus is, right? Old people are going to look so weird when we're old, right? Why? Fashion, the way we talk, the things we watch. Yeah, who can knows, you, But man. can you listen? Can you imagine just like some 80-year-old listening to old Snoop Dogg classics driving down? Yeah, you know, you know just... because I think like, I don't know, when I'm, I think in 20 years from now, the the opportunity to stay young and with all the technology and I'll get like, we'll hit singularity <laughs> and I'll be able to just like live forever and, and just look exactly as I do right now. Well, Daniel, I I hope you find immortality one day. Thank you so much for having me in your home and being on the podcast. All right, man. It's a pleasure. How good was that, right? Quick brag, we're only eight podcasts in, and we've already snagged three of the top ten tournament winners ever. No big deal. Be sure to follow Daniel on Twitter at RealKidPoker. You can catch up with his blog at FullContactPoker.com and check out his YouTube channel at YouTube.com slash Also, please rate, review, and subscribe. Send your reviews to PokerStories at CardPlayer.com for a chance at winning a free subscription to the magazine. See you next time.